Hello, welcome again to Inquiring Minds. This is Kathy Blocker, your host. Today I am at the Gann Museum here in Benton. If you are from around Benton, anywhere around the area, you probably know where we are. This uh, gentleman here with me is Mr. Elton Fitzhugh. He is here to talk to us about the museum, about the Gann building, tell us some interesting facts and some of the things that he knows about the building, some of the things that uh, are here and, and why it is here. Welcome, Mr. Fitzhugh. Thank you, Will, and thank you for coming. Would you like to start off with this room that we are sitting in and tell us what is significant about this room? This is one of the two front rooms of the original building, which is the only building in the world that is documented to be built of bauxite. And that's something special to me because I'm not a bauxite girl. Well, it's, it's something <laughs> special. We have people that come just to see it because it's made of bauxite. But this was originally the ladies' waiting room. The ladies' waiting room for getting their hair done or? No, for their doctor's appointment. Oh, so this was originally a, a doctor's Oh, office. yes, it's Dr. Gann. Dr. Gann. And that's why it's called Gann Museum. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and this was the ladies? Yes, ma'am. And there, we can't see it right now, but there is a, was a separate room, totally walled off from this room, that was the gentleman's waiting room. Okay, so they had two front doors, and one side was for ladies, and one side was for gentlemen. Yes. And this was, uh, what time period are we talking this about? This building was built in 1893. Wow, that wasn't long after the Civil War, was it? <laughs> uh, did Dr. Gann build this building for his A office? A group of patients built it for him. Um, there are three lots here, and two years later he built his house next door. So they knew, and they owed him money. So rather than giving him a pig or a chicken or actual cash, they offered to build a building. And this is what he designed for them. So Dr. Gann designed the building? Well, yes, I, I, pretty much I believe he did. Okay. And we had, there were segregated waiting rooms by gender, and then there was a door in each waiting room that he could open that door and call someone in to the exam room or surgery or what a consultation room. Okay. <laughs> you can see this doorway here. The original moldings were left, but the doorway was filled in. He would, if he wanted to see a lady, he would step to this door and call who he wanted to see. There's a corresponding door on the other side of what was one time a solid wall, and he could call a man through that door. So they, they probably needed to keep men and women segregated because men probably came in more with injuries than Yes, sicknesses. If, if they came, mostly if they came in, they were either, for an appointment, they were either old and sick or they were injured on the job. A lot of guys came in bleeding. Um, my fifth grade teacher Mrs. Curtis from Angie Grant remembers, I remember her telling the story of um, Dr. Gann removing her dad's lower leg, and I assume it was done in that room. I would imagine so. So Dr. Gann had separate rooms, and you say these uh, men, probably the head of a household, uh, got together and built this building. They built this in payment for the bills that they owed. In payment. Don't think that would work today, do you? Well, <laughs> I'd sure like to try. They were probably miners from the bauxite mines, which are not too far from here. Uh, I don't, since it's built from bauxite? It's built from bauxite, and bauxite, they knew it would be mined commercially, but it was not yet mined commercially. The bauxite that this building is built from which we're not seeing any of it right now because we're inside. But we'll see some of it later. Yeah, we'll see okay. some of it later. But it was harvested from a farm just south of here, 
I, we don't know the exact location. And then it was seasoned for six weeks. And our best guess as to what that means is that it was taken off the ground and allowed to sit out during maybe July and August. I don't know. Basically, it was to allow it to dry out. It's very wet when you dig it up. Well, if it wouldn't season in July and August in Arkansas, it That's wouldn't right. season. But uh, just for our viewers who may not know, what is bauxite, other than the name of the town just east of here? Well, I'm not a scientist, but um, bauxite is the rock or the mineral that we get alumina from, which is what aluminum is produced from. I got that. I appreciate you saying that. that I know it? that my dad worked in the aluminum industry for 40 years and I know that, but I wanted you to answer the question. This was Dr. Dan's rocking chair. We only have three pieces of office furniture that are original to the office. The roll top desk, the secretary's chair, and this rocking chair. And the only reason I mention it is to point out the darkening here on the back because later on in the tour I'm going to show you something that relates to that that's kind of amazing. That's quite interesting. I can hardly wait to see. I noticed this uh, picture frame in the middle holds a picture. Is that Helen Keller? That is Helen Keller. She was, and it has her signature. It's addressed to Bill. Bill was a pen pal of hers. And she was in Benton to change trains because she wanted to go to Hot Springs. And this was where you, you know, you couldn't drive to Hot Springs. You had to take the train. So this is a letter that she wrote when she returned from her trip. And it's written to Bill. He was a kind of porter at the train depot and she talks about her trip and she received a piece of pottery as a gift while she was here. We assume that that's Nilo. Um, but she writes back to Bill, but the most, I think the most interesting thing is what she has penciled in at the bottom because being blind and having to learn to write it, to me is amazing. And you could learn her signature pretty easily, but to come up and write a two-line sentence. She's pictured on a sofa that is a 1920s-style sofa. And she writes here, I think I promised you a photograph. I'm sending one with, in quotes, punch and my love. And we believe that punch is her little dog that she's holding. Kids love this. I'm sure that they would, knowing that she was not only blind, but also deaf. Uh, she was an amazing woman. And this picture on the bottom, uh, that's the picture, uh, a picture of this building. It is. It's a picture of the building as it stood when it was built. And you can see that it hasn't changed very much. The only, it had five gables, the back gable, um, has been roofed over in a, late, in a later edition, but the front is totally original. Okay, that's very interesting. Now you mentioned Nilo pottery. I, I know that there was a Nilo factory here in Benton. Uh, I know you have a display of Nilo. We have could, a we move in, could we move into the pottery room? Sure. And look at it? Okay, this is the pottery room, and this is so fascinating. And knowing that it was made here in Benton, in our hometown here, uh, that makes it more fascinating. This is a potter, pottery wheel. Yes, it's actually Charles Hyden's pottery wheel, who made my, developed Nilo. Um, it's a, a kick wheel, which... If you try now to stop it, you'll see that there's quite a lot of weight running there. But he did have a treadle, like a treadle sewing machine. machine. He had a pedal that he used. 
and eventually he put it in the electric motor. It's not set up as it would be if it were being used. You'd have to be coordinated to use that with use your foot on that and your hands you, up here. <laughs> he had a number of talents. Okay. He was a renowned father. And this is a sample of the clay that was used. Where did this clay come from? I don't know the exact location. All the clays made in in my book. All, we've had 13 potteries. There have actually been about a dozen potteries in Saline County, which wow. for our size is quite a big, and then there were seven running at the same time. Is that because of the availability of material to make pottery? It is, in, in some part. Pottery was made in Hot Springs and in Camden also, so it's, it's kind of central to the region, but they would put a site, they would put a boxcar on a siding, and all the different potters would bring their wares and put them in the boxcar, and when they, when the boxcar was full, the railroad would put another empty boxcar and start their deliveries. Wow, that's interesting. This place is full of history. I love it. Can you tell me anything about any of these pieces back here? I still have a little research to do. Okay. But this is <laughs> all nylon. It is all nylon. This is, this is a later period of my life. Okay. Um, the planters re commemorate our allies in World War II. So the polar bear is, of course, Russia. The kangaroo is Australia. I know the Parrot is from Burma or what is now called Myanmar okay. in Southeast Asia. And I have not researched the rest of them to know exactly where they came from. There's a lot to a lot of work. Yes, there's a lot of reading involved. There, there's, you don't just sit in this place and ask no. and answer questions. <laughs> no. I've learned that already. But I always tell people, if I say the wrong thing, don't hesitate to correct Well, me. none of us are perfect, but we like to be that way in our jobs anyway. I noticed a lot of the, the swirl nylog. Now, I'm familiar with nylog. My mother collected uh, cam art pottery, mm -hmm. which, like you said, was made in, in Camden, Arkansas, right. hence the name cam art. But uh, the swirl is nylog. Uh, do you know anything about the, uh, the swirl? I do. I do. And some of this swirl pottery, there's uh, several different shapes and bases and things. Can you please tell me a, something about it? It has a very complex history. It, it took Mr. Lighton, whose nickname was Bullet, and even though a lot of us never met him, we tend to think of him as Bullet. Um, it's a unique process. It took him about 10 years to develop it. He worked with other potters. He worked with chemists. But these are the colors of the naturally occurring clay. And in the USGS surveys, they will list, in some black part of the page, they'll list the colors of the clay that they found when they died. That's quite interesting. Uh, that answered another one of my questions is, does the clay come out of the ground, these colors mixed together, or did well, he mix them? It doesn't come out in these shapes. Uh, well, I know he, not these shapes, but, but the colors. He, he mixed them, and that is what took so long, because in his first attempts at it, you know, pottery is fired twice in the kiln at around 1,300 degrees, I believe. I'm not positive about that. But all the colors browned out. So you would see different shades of brown. So he had to work on different pigmentations and dyes. He worked with chemists and other potters to develop the ability for it to survive the second firing. And the unique thing about Nylock is that it's the exterior that you see. It's not painted or a decal. It's just clay. So the interiors are glazed, but the exteriors are raw clay. You were telling me something interesting about 
the price of this uh, back years ago uh, at an auction? Well, yes, I'm sure a lot of your viewers will be familiar with Oscar Parnum, and he held an auction every Friday night, which I used to attend with my family. He would not auction Nilo. It was too much trouble. So he sold it for a dollar a vertical inch. So a five inch tall base was five dollars. Wow, and today it would be approximately, do you have any idea? Um, cabinet bases like this, probably around 175 to two and a quarter, 250. Uh, you know, the time to buy an antique is when you see it. Uh, now, now you're not talking a dollar and a half, a dollar seventy-five. No, that's the that'd be more like the original price. So you mean it would be more like a hundred or two hundred dollars an inch? Well, you don't really sell by the inch. Not now. I not understand now. that, but if you want to break it down, it yeah, would be something like that. it would be that would be like a five or six hundred dollar bag. Now you inch. told me there's a very unique piece in this cabinet. Would you show me and tell me what it is? Well. It's this round ball. Uh, people don't pay much attention to it. You kind of have to point it out to them. It is a gear shift knob for a Model T. Um, it has a piece of threaded brass underneath, and you just took your, you screwed your gear shift knob off and put this one on, and you're ready to go. Okay, so if, uh, I remember, I don't remember it was never Henry. commercially produced. Uh, I don't remember Henry Ford saying this because I'm not quite that old, but I remember that he did say anybody could have a car just like they wanted it as long as they wanted it black. That's right. So this way, uh, this was a way, way to make it a little more exotic. Uh, a little more exotic, personalized That's gear right. shift. Uh, well, let's move on to the next room and see what we have in there. Okay. Okay, this piece here that you might think is an a lighthouse or maybe a churn or something. Uh, that's not what it is. Uh, no, I, I think a butter churn was the inspiration for it, but it's actually a grave marker. Um, in 1878, a couple came through with a covered wagon moving west and they crossed the river down at Lockhart's Landing and camped out. They had two children, a boy and a girl, and they both became ill and they both died. They didn't have any money. O.C. Atchison, who went on to form a fire brick company at Pearl, Arkansas, made and gave them two of these as markers for their children's grave. The reason that we have this, they were buried in the Old Lee Cemetery, a military. The reason that we have these is that in the 1970s, some relative, I don't know who, called Pat Dunhue, who at that time was the town's historian, and asked him to go and get this remaining marker. The other marker had been stolen, and they were afraid that this one would be stolen, so they asked him to get it before it was stolen or before the lawnmowers ate it up. You can see all the chipping here from the lawnmowers because it's solid. That's one solid piece of uh, clay. clay. Uh, I thought when I first looked at it that it was a churn and it had all that was just decoration. I'm it, sure those I'm, two <laughs> kids wish that's what it was. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, that's very interesting, okay? Let's see what else we can find. You know, we were talking about Nile Oak and all its origins and all the potteries in Saline County. One reason Saline County supported so many potteries is that the clay is kaolin clay, and it's a very, very fine clay. It's not gritty, it's not grainy, it, it's very fine. And Bullet Hyten discovered that Saline County had deposits of kaolin clay. For centuries, it was thought it was only found in China. And when China, China started exporting things, a lot of it was tableware, such as blue willow. And it was made from kale and clay. 
But he discovered that we have kaolin clay. So he simply took kaolin and reversed it to make the name Nylock. That's quite interesting, but I do remember reading that somewhere now that you mention it. So K-A-O-L-I-N, kaolin That's clay. right. And when you were a little girl and your grandma got the good china out, it, people called their good dishes china because that's where they came from originally. Okay, quite interesting. You know, I pointed out Dr. Dan's rocking chair and showed you the discoloration on the back. Yes. And that's pretty boring until you connect it to this. You see, this is a 90 degree angle all the way down to here. And okay. then there's a big indention here. Yes, I see This that. is the old exterior of the office. So when you're standing out here, you were in the backyard. Probably had shade trees. Dr. Gann would drag that rocking chair out here when he wasn't busy and put his foot there to rock. And in a few short years, that's how much bauxite wore away. Well, bauxite is a soft uh, rock. And it, all of these colors, too, uh, that's, that's all natural. Yes. And bauxite. It's, it's beautiful colors, and, and, and I love it. But that's quite interesting, and you'll never find another building like this. Sort. No, that's... Even, even with, the, with the footprint. That, that the just dark. adds to our uniqueness. Yes, it does. Here on this wall, we have some pictures, cartoons, uh, some information. This is something everyone from Saline County should know. I didn't know it till I came to the uh, to the uh, museum today. This is a picture of J. P. Alley. He drew cartoons, the old Hambone cartoons. If any of you remember those, he's the one that did them. And after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, it was said that. Hambone had to go. So he got a job working for the Memphis uh, newspaper, the Commercial Appeal, drawing political cartoons. And some years later, uh, these are some examples of his political cartoons, but some years later, the Commercial Appeal uh, was nominated for and won a Pulitzer Prize for their political cartoons. Now, this is a native uh, from Saline County. He was born somewhere around Sedale, and it, you might know where that is, I'm not sure, but it was somewhere close to Benton at any rate. And these are just some of, a collection of his works. But you need to know about people from our county. You never know what you can do until you try. The bauxite has its own museum, and we don't. We want to be good neighbors. We don't want to step on any toes. And I like bauxite, so we have a, an exhibit called the Aluminum Era. It contains a, a number of alumina, number of containers of alumina, in various stages of reduction, um, and. Also, we show some samples from other countries. You may have noticed that there are a few Roy Rogers items. That's our current exhibit right now. So if something looks out of place to you, that's why it's there. We especially like this painting. It's a scale painting of an imaginary cutaway of the Mars Hill Mine, painted to scale. So, I, and I don't know the scale, I wish I did, but all these marks here are the tunnels with directionals painted in, and you see where the gray areas are, that's where they would run into areas that didn't contain bauxite, and they would have to move down or sideways. And this hung in the Reynolds Metals office until it was torn down. So we're especially proud to have that. This is what I call our pioneer section. Most of the items, besides the Roy Rogers things, were donated 
from Slane County families when the museum was first formed. Um, Siebert Magby helped put this together and built most of it. Uh, Glenn Sago Jr. worked on the mural above. The mantle is from the Pete Shaw cabin in <laughs> Keep going. The mantle itself is from the Pete Steele cabin in the Shaw community. The wood above it is from at least that portion and probably more is from the Pete, the Max Stainer cabin. What is this funny looking thing up here between the, the lamp and the clock? That's a Roy Rogers telephone. Uh, that's a telephone? Now look, I, I know this, but I know some of our viewers are not going to know that that is a telephone. Would you explain that to us? Well, it has a little crank over here. I see that crank. You just pick this up and put it to your ear to listen. Central, when we first got telephones in Benton, Central's number was zero. Dr. Gann's number was one. Oh, so he was okay. an early adopter of technology. Oh, wow. Now, I've seen telephones like this used on Lassie. Now, I don't have cable TV or satellite TV, but I do get RTV, which is retro TV, which if anyone doesn't have these things, they know that 7.2 uh, on, on just a regular TV. And I see Lassie on there once in a while, and Timmy will go to the wall, and he'll turn his crank, and he'll hold this up. But he gets a hold of this little black thing on there, and, you know, moves it up or down, you know, depending on. So I, I understand that's a telephone, but I, a lot of our viewers don't. Well, and coincidentally, that earpiece that you hold to your ear lends itself to the shape of a candlestick. And Bullet Heighton used to make nylon candlesticks for the ladies at Central as gifts. He never produced them commercially, but they were given as gifts. That's, that's a unique bit of information there. Too. So history is all woven together, one it, way or it another. Is. It is. It truly is. The stockings for Roy and Dale and Trigger are not normally here. I understand that. Uh, this is early Saline County, as you can see. It represents the agricultural side, the mining side, basically the way people made their livings. It's blacksmiths or whatever their calling was. Some of the tools I know, some I don't. This is one of my favorite tools because it's specific to mining. And it's actually, it's not a handmade tool. It was made in Cincinnati, Ohio. It is, as you can see, a hammer and a pick combined. That would be a very handy tool if you were out mining. This is some very interesting things. I love museums. I love old things like this. And I know you told us about the, the things standing up here on it. That is a corn sheller. You put the, let the corn dry in the field and then go through the field and pick the dry ears and shut them, put them in the top and turn the crank and it, or the wheel and it would shell the corn. Oh, and that's I, okay. a lot of farmers raise their own feed for their animals. Uh, my dad had a corn sheller when I was a kid, but it wasn't like that. It just, you know, it was much less complicated, but that's what that is, and it's, it's uh, very interesting, and that one was made by International Harvester. Yes, it was a gift from a gentleman in Haskell who unfortunately passed away in the process of giving it to us. But at least it got here. Yes, and we have and, the history of it. And, and I love to take children to museums and ask them questions about things like this. Uh, they don't have any idea. We took a group of young children to uh, Old Washington State Park and uh, down close to Hope one time from our, from our church. 
and the furniture was so small and I asked the kids about that and believe it or not they knew why the furniture was smaller because we're all a lot larger nowadays than people were back then they were smaller and I said, but where did they put the TV? Well, it hadn't been invented by then. And I was so proud of the kids for, for thinking about that. But this museum, uh, it, it's a museum now, but like you said, it was built for a doctor's office. Has it been anything besides a yes. museum or doctor's yes. office? Yes. Uh, Dr. Gann and Sr. and his wife, Martha Whitmore Gann, had two children, Dual Jr. and Earl. And your viewers probably think, oh, they had two boys. But Earl was a young lady, and it was spelled I-R-L. Um, Duell was married twice, had no children from either marriage, Duell Jr. And in 1947, they gave the three-room office, the original building, to the city of Benton in honor of his parents for use as a library. And of course, those rooms are very small by today's standards. So before it could function as a library, they added this large room that we're sitting in now. And there's, that's why we have the space we have. So it was a library when I was in grade school, and I've had lots of people come in, and it was a library when they were in junior high or high school or they did research here. I remember when it was a library. I was in elementary school too and each summer we had a bookmobile come around. Now I was born and uh, raised in Boxside but not in the, in the town of Boxside but outside. Actually I'm from Detana, Arkansas. But Detana? you know no, we called it Detana. You can oh, always okay. tell if a person's from the area or not because they call it Detana if you're from there. If not, they'll say Detani. And uh, that's where I really grew up. But, you know, uh, if I say Boxside, a lot of people in Arkansas don't know where Boxside is. But I grew up down there in the country, and every summer at the bookmobile, well, for a few summers, the bookmobile would go down. It was just a, a, a van-type truck that had books in it and it would go to specific places where there were neighborhoods where there were a lot of children and stop and we could check out books and then we could they would come back a week or so later and we could exchange books and it came from the Saline County Library. At least I think it did. <laughs> now that I say it, it maybe it didn't. Did. But was that the first Saline County Library? Was it first housed here or was there Saline County Library in existence before then? You know, Kathy, I have to tell you, every visitor I talk to always comes up with that special question. <laughs> the one where I say, I have no idea. I really don't know. I, I assume that we did have a library before this, but I couldn't tell you where it was or, or anything. That might be a good program for, for a later time, just to do a history on the library. And uh, viewers, we will get to that eventually. And we'll answer that question. Yeah, we might it. even come back and tell Mr. Uh, Fitchu the answer. I'm always but, interested. But uh, I do appreciate your honesty. I'd much rather somebody tell me I don't know than to, to tell me something they don't... They, they made up. They made up. That's true. But this is a very interesting building. If you've never seen a building uh, made out of bauxite, you need to come and see this. And as Mr. Fitchu mentioned, there's an exhibit of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans here lots and lots of uh, Roy and Dale uh, memorabilia. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> but anyway, there's lots of it here. It's very interesting. And when uh, I was driving a truck, I, I've been through Victorville, California numerous times, more than I care to count, down Interstate 15. And the Roy Rogers and Dale Evans Museum was always there on the right going south towards LA. And someday I'm going to stop and, and see what's in that museum. That's what I would always say. Never got to do so, but I hear it's been moved to Granson. So maybe someday I'll get up there to see it. But there's a lot of uh, uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans things in here that's been uh, uh, loaned to the library. Is that correct? To the museum. 
to you're, the museum. You're not the first person to do that. <laughs> and uh, who owns these, uh, this exhibit? This is a small portion of the collection of Virginia Keeter Caldwell. Virginia Caldwell. Now, why would she have this? Well, uh, Dale Evans, the queen of the Caldwells, moved to Osceola at the age of eight. So from what I understand, although I wasn't there, from what I understand, they basically grew up together. So uh, Miss Caldwell and, and Miss Evans were friends. Miss yes. Evans, I've never called her that, sorry, Dale. But I've never called Dale Evans Miss Evans before, but they were friends, and she has th uh, this, and she has loaned it to the library. Is this the only exhibit you've ever had here? No, we had this exhibit in 2009, and we had many more artifacts, but unfortunately, the weather took over in 2010, and the museum had to be closed. The water stains are visible down here. This room was carpeted three times before anyone walked in it. So it was, a, it was a big event. I'm sure that it was. And we had a lot of requests, so we brought some of it back, and it has appeal for visitors of all ages. I'm sure that it would, and uh, for me, uh, my generation, uh, I can sit in here and you know, I see the, the picture of Roy on, on his horse, Trigger, you know, and, and, and I can just, in my mind, I'm seeing him riding on TV, you know, in black and white, of course. Of course. Of, of course. And, you know, it, it brings back lots of memories. Uh, what does it cost to come in the museum? Well, currently, and we try to keep it, we're working to keep it that way, admission is free. But do you accept donations? We do accept donations, and we have a wonderful, wonderful organization called Friends of the Museum who subscribe and um, give us financial gifts. And that's basically, and we have some government support, and that's basically our support. So uh, if I wanted to bring someone in, I wouldn't have to... Uh, budget in a ticket to the museum. No, and if you couldn't come when we're open, if you call me in advance, I'll arrange for a private show. Uh, what? How would I get in touch with you? Well, um, I would give you my number. If you said. <laughs> now I I got your number. I got your number. But for our viewers, if they wanted to, uh, they would call the museum at seven seven eight five five one three and leave a message and I call back and we, you know, sometimes it happens that day, sometimes it's two weeks from then, it just depends. You, you call back, but we're all busy. This is one of the times and it's just a generation thing or, or, or this time in history, but we all stay pretty busy. But we do. You would return the call, that's 501-778-5513. You know, everyone enjoys museums, and they are a lot of fun. Um, like all nonprofits, all of them are struggling now. And particularly, the nonprofits in Benton have a real challenge in front of them. In a few years, we'll have a four year university, we'll have a visitor center with a hotel, and Museums have a double job. They have to look back because that's what we're about, history. But we have to always be thinking about the future and how we're going to survive next year and the year following. I understand that. Uh, you have a, a wonderful exhibit of, uh, from Roy and Dale's things. Uh, do you have other exhibits here at any other times? Oh, sure. Last year was the 150th, well, it was the 100th anniversary of the Confederate reunion, which took place in Little Rock, So, we, and the sesquicentennial of the beginning of the Civil War. So we have a wonderful Civil War exhibit. And we have all the, everything's locked, we have multi-pronged security systems 24 hours a day. So if you have something 
you'd like to show that's really valuable, don't hesitate. Contact us. Uh, that That's very interesting. Uh, I have enjoyed this show so much today. Uh, I, I love museums. I love history. Uh, you know, uh, students in high school, and I know you told me your wife teaches high school English. I used to teach high school English, but we're not going there today. Okay. But uh, when I was in high school, history was not my favorite subject. Now, I'm not going to say I didn't like it, but it wasn't my favorite. But uh, it is important that we learn about history because if we don't know what mistakes we have made, we won't know how to avoid them in the future. So that's one reason for learning about history. And you start digging into history and then you dig into genealogy and who knows, you might have been uh, related to, uh, to uh, some very famous person or something or you might have been related to some notorious person you don't want anyone to know about, but you won't know if you don't uh, check it out. So I'm inviting you to check out the museum here in Benton, and we've given you just about all the information I can think of that we need, except for location. 218 South Market Street, next door Wise Furniture, the Gann House is on the other side and across the street from First Baptist Church. And if you can't follow those di di uh, directions, give me a call and I'll draw you a map. Now that's Kathy Blocker, 501-317-7187. If you have other ideas for shows or comments, negative or positive, by all means let me know, especially if they're negative so next time I, I can do something so you'll make positive comments. But for today, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. I hope you've learned some things. Please come and visit the museum. We didn't cover everything here. There's no way we